Dame Julie Andrews and Emma Walton Hamilton. Please come up. Wow, gosh. It was quite nice, empty nice when we people. walked in. <laughs> so yeah. this is the first day of their book tour for a new book called Homework, which is written by both of them. It's actually the second book in a trilogy. The third book is not finished yet, right, Emma? Not started. <laughs> oh, not even started. <laughs> give me, no, just give me a month or so, OK? <laughs> <laughs> My stepfather was an alcoholic, and it they were in vaudeville, my mother and my stepfather, and they discovered at about age seven with me that I had this freak, really freaky soprano voice. And uh, they were as surprised as anybody, I think, but <laughs> my stepfather began to give me singing lessons. He was a tenor. My mother played the piano and accompanied him. And uh, they were in vaudeville, in music hall, and traveling all around. And very shortly, I joined them in their act. And uh, m my stepfather, I hated those lessons, you can imagine. But um, he very quickly put me in the hands of a wonderful lady who was a phenomenal singing teacher. And she gave me the technique that I've used all my life, and a survival technique, too, for protecting a voice and so on. She was phenomenal and was really my first mentor. So working with her, I, my voice improved and improved and improved. And about 12 years old, I got my first debut in, on the London stage. And the audience was so surprised that I could sing this incredible aria with an F above top C and twice nightly. Did you understand you're now 26, 27? Um, Emma's just a born. very green and very young 26, 27. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I think maybe that's a bit. Well, modest, really, I think. if you <laughs> think about this kid from Walton on Thames in England, and, and I was learning on my feet everywhere I went. It was like racing to catch up with the great good fortune that was in but, front but, of me. But these people were not stupid, they understood. The talent. That well, they could possessed. tell that and, I could sing very well. And they understood. They they understood. They saw something in you that you, you may not. That I did not see in myself. That's right. true. Yes. When when you saw Mary Poppins and you saw its production, how did you perceive yourself? Well, I was rather stunned actually because uh, filmmaking is so different from theatre. You know, in theatre you start at the beginning, you finish at the end of a story. It's full figure the whole evening long. And in film, you could start shooting in the middle of the movie, and it could be in close-up, or it could be in a waist shot, or it could be a full figure, and many, many takes. And then you could shoot the end of the film, and it's all to do with the expense of, you know, are we filming in the castle this week? Because all the scenes in the castle will have to be filmed at the same time, and so on, to save expenses. And so it's so totally different and the different lenses on the cameras and it was quite an education and I knew nothing about it at the time. I didn't do the movie of, of My Fair Lady and was feeling a bit, you know, sad but understood it because I, other than being on Broadway, uh, I wasn't known at the, and they needed a big, big stars to cast the film. But it's very hard to be upset when Walt Disney comes along and says, would you like to make Mary Poppins? And uh, wow, what an amazing chance that was. Today, Sound of Music is the third highest grossing film in history. Wow, still, huh? Still. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so it is for, for what you will forever be known for, right, in terms of impact and scale globally. Well, aren't I the lucky one, really? And, yeah. uh, and the, the scene, which is in the opening, where you're singing the sound of music in the field with the, the uh, mountains around you. Yes. And there's obviously a camera coming straight at you. Tell us what happens. <laughs> <clears throat> well, today it would probably be a camera on a... Um, Drone. On a drone, <laughs> but uh, in those days there weren't any drones, and uh, 
it was in a helicopter. There was a very brave cameraman hanging out the side of this helicopter, <laughs> strapped in and le no door, just, just filming. And I was walking across the field in that opening, as you know. There were several takes needed before the cameraman was pleased and, and I hit my marks correctly and it was this vast field. And then we started walking to each other toward each other, or oh, I started walking and he started flying. Um, <laughs> and uh, this thing was coming at me like a sort of crab sideways in this weird way, this coming across the grass. I could see the grass bending as it, as it flew over it. And then he got his shot and as he went around me to get another shot and to go back to the beginning and I had to go back to the beginning of the field, the downdraft from the jet engines just leveled me into the ground. <laughs> and uh, so I came up, you know, eventually spitting mud and hay and God knows what. And I got really angry. Um, I kept thinking, can't he just see that he's knocking me down every time he starts again? And, um, and, and so he does I, it, and he does it even closer. Well, <laughs> he seemed to. Anyway, I don't think he could see me waving and telling him to go make a wider circle, because all I got was, great, let's do one more, you know. You spent some time with Hitchcock, right? I did. What was he like? Very interesting gentleman. <laughs> uh, is he like the stereotype we have? Yes, he is very much. <laughs> I mean, all you have to do is hear him say, good evening, and you, <laughs> you kind of know uh, what Hitch is like. But very knowledgeable, very funny, very kind, too. And he would, he, he said to me one day, uh, that his cameraman was asking what kind of a lens to put on a certain scene and suggested one. And Hitchcock said, on a woman, uh, whatever the number the lens was, he said, good heavens, no, it, you know. And I said, you know, I wish I knew more about camera lenses and stuff. And he said, come with me. And he took me to a table and for the next half hour or so drew what the different lenses did. And in other words, if you have two wider lens, your nose grows longer in profile and so on. So uh, he said, don't ever let them shoot you that way or this way. And then he was a, he loved art. And he would say, come and look in the camera. I've made a Mondrian. And uh, I did know, thank God, who Mondrian was. And I looked in the camera. And indeed, the background was a Mondrian. And Paul Newman and I were going to be standing in front of it. So about this time, you come across Blake, who becomes... <laughs> That's a wonderful description. Come across. Yes, yes, it's true. Right, because you're in the Hollywood. He's in Hollywood. And yes. he's busy doing the Pink Panther series. Well, he had made uh, a lot of them, but, but oh, certainly the first, He'd already made the the first, first two, one. yes. And, and this... in the book, you tell a story of your, I'm just going to call it a first, the first real date. Yes. Well, how we met was extraordinary too, Eric. Where here we were. Uh, I was heading to my therapist at the time, and this, in the middle, uh, it's so hokey, it's ridiculous. Um, in the middle of Sunset Boulevard on the Meridian, uh, waiting for all the traffic to let me through, uh, a car coming in the opposite direction pulled up beside me, also waiting, and I looked over, and this nice-looking gentleman was driving this Rolls-Royce. And then it happened again a couple of days later, and then again, at which point this nice-looking gentleman rolled down the window and said, are you going to where I just came from? And I presumed he'd been in therapy too, because that was the street where <laughs> most of the uh, <laughs> analysts uh, hung out, let's say. And I said, I, th I think so. He said, well, good luck. I'm Blake Edwards. And I went, oh, uh, how lovely to meet you, Mr. Edwards. And then about two weeks later, I got a call that he would love to meet and talk about a project, which we eventually did. And uh, we began dating from that point onwards. And I tried sort of quite hard not to fall in love with this extremely charismatic gentleman. <laughs> Uh, talented, funny as all get out, black sense of humor. And uh, I tell you, it was impossible. He just was a very winning fellow. So and tell, eventually you, we married, yeah. You tell a story where you're driving along in Malibu and you pull over. On, yeah, well, on. he asked me if I'd like to go for a drive one evening. And I was completely... By the way, in the Rolls Royce. In the Rolls Royce, yes. <laughs> and I was completely dressed up, having been to some 
obligatory um, uh, evening where, where I had been giving a speech or doing something. So he, he called and I said, I'm home now. And he said, well, would you like to go for a drive? And I looked at my watch and I said, well, I'm all dressed up and it's 11 o'clock. He said, I'll be right round. <laughs> so he came around and we drove all the way along the Pacific Coast Highway, hugely romantic. And uh, eventually he pulled over and it was one of those really great nights. The moon was rising over the sea and everything. And I thought, dear God, if he doesn't kiss me, I'm going to go crazy. <laughs> and he did. And that was that from was, then on. That was, that was it. He had two children by a previous marriage, and we adopted two children. Tell that story about you being in the middle and the end and the... Oh. <laughs> Just, just that, for a second there. Just that I've, I've had the bizarre experience of, of uh, being on every single level of the birth order spectrum at various points <laughs> of my life. Yes. So I'm, I'm the only child of my mom and dad, but then I inherited two st older step-siblings when she remarried, so I became the youngest on that family, and then I inherited a younger step-sibling on my dad's side, and I became the eldest in that family. And then they adopted two younger, my two younger sisters, and then I was the middle child, so. <laughs> and, 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 I'm and, and, the, and, uh, the only eldest, middle, youngest. Yeah, and, so Emma, and staunch and <laughs> stalwart and brave. She really was. Right. <sighs> well, I think a couple of things, truthfully, Eric. One is that mom made a monumental effort, being, being the, very much the caretaker and the soul child of a very is, damaged home, and the yeah. child of a yeah. damaged home herself. She made a monumental effort to uh, create as safe and nurturing a home environment. One of the reasons why home continues to come up as a title and a theme in these books um, as possible. A lot of that, I also think, had to do with the number of years that you put it, put in working on yourself and therapy, and, yeah. and how that enabled her to parent well. And then I also had my father, and I had the ability to leave Hollywood and come to New York and spend and summers and Christmases and, and, and Easter's and so and, forth and here. And yeah. so. It also sounds like your parents worked hard to protect you from the paparazzi and the weird stuff they that did. goes on. Yeah. So in the book, you and I, then I have I to add a P.S. to that, Eric, and that is that she has the, from my point of view, the, the greatest heart and generosity. I mean, when I say, would you mind if we adopted? a child and then would you mind if we adopted another and uh, she said well all right as long as i don't have to babysit you know and, and, and then and was not the first... entirely generous and, and, <laughs> but you and, were the first to babysit almost from julian i grew up on the princess diaries <laughs> okay what made you decide to take that role p.s will you adopt me <laughs> Only oh. if I don't have to babysit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, what made me accept the role? Really, the director, uh, Gary Marshall, uh, I met because he was thinking of me for the, for the role of, of Queen Clarice. And uh, I, he was so adorable and so funny and knew so much. And uh, I just fell in love with him. And he asked me so many questions that I might. What, if I did do the movie, what would be the thing that was sold in Genovia? And I said, well, probably if, let's say it's between uh, France, uh, south of France and Spain, let's say, right on the border, maybe they'd have pears <laughs> and maybe they'd make, the nuns would make lace. And of course, pears and lace were all over the film. <laughs> But he was such a darling to work with. Because we know each other so well, and we've worked together for so many years, and we've written so many books, there wasn't much that was surprising. Um, other than that with this particular book, I was there as a child throughout most of it and share many of the memories, but I share them from the perspective of a child's point of view. And so it was, it was surprising and interesting to see when I thought, you know, mom has it all together because mom's a grown up and grown ups know everything, <laughs> you know, that in fact, according to her diaries or according to the conversations we were having, that she was feeling vulnerable or insecure or questioning. Just about or all the time, yeah. 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 So that was, that was kind of interesting, remembering my younger self. Of course, I get it now because I'm a mom and I know that you never really feel like you have, have it all answered and figured out. Frustrating. 
probably the most frustrating thing was that she kept wanting to go back and rewrite the first chapter. <laughs> it is my, and, it's really the way I yeah, love to work. And my job was to help keep moving the story forward. And so I kept saying, Mom, we'll, go, we'll have plenty of time to edit. We'll have plenty of time to polish. We've got to move on. We've got to get the bones of this down. And she said, I just want to go back to that one sentence where. If I got the and, first chapter right, I figured the style would reveal itself or it would flow from then on. It didn't, but. <laughs> <laughs> Blake and I were making our first film, which was a huge flop, ultimately, and you'd think that would have been disaster and would have ended the relationship, but it didn't. Um, but we were uh, on location in Ireland, and uh, we took all the kids, packed everything up, uh, uh, tucked them under our wing, so to speak, and we stayed in this extraordinary castle-like mansion uh, which had been phenomenal in, in olden days in a thousand acre estate. We filmed on that estate. We filmed in that manor, that great manor house. Uh, and we lived there as well, which helped pay a lot of the bills and so on. Um, but the children for that summer ran, well, went wild. I mean, they didn't pick up, they didn't make beds, they didn't brush their teeth, they did nothing. And so, I mean, completely... We were waiting for her to snap her fingers and the whole thing would clean itself. Well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I finally said, oh, you know, the Mary Poppins in me rose up, and I said, okay, guys, what we're gonna do is we're gonna play a game. If you cannot at least uh, put the laundry away or brush your teeth at night or whatever, then you're gonna have to pay a forfeit. Uh, and uh, the eldest girl, Jennifer, who was Blake's eldest daughter, my stepdaughter, said, uh, OK, uh, Jules, but you have to play the game too. And I said, well, what do I have to do? <laughs> she said, well, you have to stop swearing so much. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't uh, vicious or anything. It was just exasperation, really. But to their ears, it was not appropriate. And I said, OK, I'll play the game too. And of course, I was the first to lose. <laughs> so uh, it didn't take long. And so when I said, all right, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, what's my forfeit going to be? Uh, Jennifer, the, the eldest girl, said, OK, uh, write me a story. And I thought at first to write her a little fable or something. And then I thought, no, it's a wonderful chance to bond with this stepdaughter that obviously adored her dad and wasn't sure about stepmom. That's part of the homework in the title. It, it, there was so much happening. And they say when you write a biography that you relive your life all over again. And it wasn't until I did at work on this book that I realized just how really hard we all were working. And it, there wasn't time to absorb uh, much, but I was sure about one thing, and that is that if my kids were all right, I was all right. But if one of them was sick or one of them had a fever and I wasn't sure that they were going to be all right, there was no way that I could concentrate on on the job, really, although I obviously had to and, and tried. But it, I admire any parent that holds down a really big job and has kids and makes it all work. And that's really the, the underlying theme of the whole, I mean, it's one of the reasons why it's called homework, is because of that tension between home life and work. And trying and to reconcile to them the both, yeah. yeah. Um, but it very much depends on how this book does. And um, if we have a if good we get asked of time. to write the third one, and yes. we'll have to promise not I to take I think the audience years, has though. an opinion. Well, yes, this one did take <laughs> almost three years to write. So uh, next I one mean, will be we'll our be day quicker. jobs kept getting in the way. If you won't keep rewriting the first chapter, you know, I'll, we'll try, I'll try, I'll try, I'll so, try. Don't so nag, I'll darling. I hope I can help my grandchildren be curious because it's the best thing uh, for being sad or bored or anything else if you're curious. Uh, I mean, for instance, how can you say you're bored in New York City? There is so much to do. And um, I love that part of life. This is the advice Julie gives to all of her friends, people who come up to her asking for things. Quote, learn your craft, do your homework. Opportunity will come along when you least expect it, as it did for me. You may not even recognize it at the time. Your job is to be as ready as possible when that good fortune comes your way. I cannot thank you enough for the book, which I encourage you all to buy and read for being here at Google. Thank you guys both. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Thank you everybody. Thank you.
so nice.